Thank you all. Thank you, Susan. What a pleasure to be here. She stole my thunder a little bit because when I'm in front of a Jewish audience, the way I usually like to begin is, yes, I am. <laughs> and I like to allow for a little space in the room because, as you all just demonstrated, there's a moment of, uh, of some surprise with this Irish-looking punim. <laughs> as you turn and you say, who knew? <laughs> but he's so tall. John Stewart told me before I was on The Daily Show that he, I'm, in fact, the tallest Jew he's ever met <laughs> in the history of not very tall Jews. Um, this is really an honor for me to be here tonight. These two men, Simon Shama, who I've just met tonight, but Rabbi Sachs, who I've known uh, and studied for some time, uh, are just such huge figures um, and have so much to say, which begs the obvious question, why do you need me? Um, I don't have a great answer other than I'm lucky enough to be able to ask them some questions and to, to draw as much as I can out of them for all of our benefit and to have them engage each other. So we'll get right to it. Uh, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs's life work is synonymous, of course, with the word faith. He is a global religious leader, philosopher, author, and moral voice of our time. Currently, the Ingeborg and Ira uh, Rennert Global Distinguished Professor of Judaic Thought at NYU and the Kressel and Efret Family University Professor of Jewish Thought at Yeshiva University. He is Professor of Law, Ethics, and the Bible at King's College London. He served as Chief Rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth from September 1991 through 2013, only the sixth incumbent since the role was formalized in 1845. Rabbi Sachs is a prolific author of 25 books and published commentaries to the daily Jewish prayer and holiday books. His most recent book, The Great Partnership, God, Science, and the Search for Meaning. And he's also going to work on, on, uh, on his studies because I think he's, uh, he hasn't done enough so far. Um, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is with us tonight. Rabbi, please come up. <laughs> My wife always tells me, when you talk about faith, it just gets so serious all the time. So we have to laugh a little bit, right? Um, Professor Simon Shama is with us as well, a prolific uh, author, prolific in his scholarly pursuits as a university professor of art history and history at Columbia University, also a Brit, uh, and is a master at conveying the highest level of intellectual thought to the general public. He's done so brilliantly. He's the author of 16 books. His latest project, The Story of the Jews, is his most personal to date, the culmination of many years in the making. The Story of the Jews was broadcast on television, and Volume 1 has been published in the UK and the US. This is a marvelous, very personal, incredibly emotional and expressive series, which I really urge you um, uh, to watch. And, and since I'm endorsing, also of all Rabbi Sachs's book, A Letter in the Scroll, I think is required reading. I'm reading it again. It's in my briefcase tonight. Um, Professor Shama is also the writer, presenter of more than 40 documentaries on art, history, and literature. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including an Emmy, a National Magazine Award for Criticism, and a National Book Critics Circle Award. Pr Professor Shama, please join us. So we will um, we'll get right to it. I think they're going to reset the clock. Otherwise, we only have eight minutes to talk, and that's not nearly enough. So the genius of Jewish survival. I've been thinking about this uh, these past few weeks. And to me, it is, uh, it is an invitation, really, to think about how Jewish survival occurred, why it occurred. And it also begs the question, in order to do what? It's a question for the Jewish people writ large, but I would also say that it's a question for all of us as individuals as we think about who we are and who we want to be in relationship to God. Um, I'm going to start with both of you on a single question, and I'll ask uh, for the purpose of brevity and getting the conversation going for just a sentence or two in reply, Rabbi Sachs. Why have Jews survived? I think we are the people 
who were called after Jacob's wrestling match with the angel. He was given the name Israel, he who wrestles with God and man and survives. And to my mind, the most significant sentence in that encounter is when the angel, as dawn is about to break, says, let me go. And Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And somehow we have wrestled with some of the worst persecution and suffering any people has ever known. And we have said to every tragedy, I will not let you go until you bless me. So we are not only the people who survived, but the people who took out of every crisis some new generativity, some new creation. And out of every bad thing that happened to us, we were determined to bring a blessing out of the curse. Simon? Well, that's very poetically beautiful, and uh, that, 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 I don't say that skeptically at all, but inevitably, Jonathan and I were saying, actually, we come at these mighty and taxing questions from a slightly different point of view. And um, the more prosaically historical view is that um, whether through a blessing or whether through necessity, um, Jews really had a code of ethics as the core of their collective existence rather than the markers of what were commonly taken to be the way to survive. Power, armies, monuments, force. Mm. Um, which is not to say um, that we were not in the force and monuments business through the biblical period. <laughs> we, we certainly were, but it was, you know, for me, if I had to take one, one moment out of the Bible, it would be um, a much less poetically profound one than, than Jonathan's. It would be the possibility of Uriah reproaching King David for iniquity, the possibility of a dialogue between morality and power is so central to Jewish existence. So when, as inevitably, all those markers which were assumed to be a source of strength, the list I've just mentioned, were ripped away from us, the way to survive was with everything else, was with reflection, spirituality, and ethics. Mm. And, you know, on and on through generation and generation, right to this moment in Israel and in the Galut, in the diaspora now, that same argument between power and not power, power and... I'm not saying that, that it's a zero-sum game. That still goes on, I believe. If I can just add to Simon, I think, Simon, uh, my favorite anti-Semite is Nietzsche, because he was... <laughs> That rarest of things, an original anti-Semite. Uh, everyone else hated Jews because they rejected Christianity. Nietzsche hated Jews because they created Christianity. <laughs> Voltaire, too. Um, yeah. Voltaire, too. And to my mind, Nietzsche framed the choice, which Simon has rightly laid before us, because Nietzsche's philosophy was based on the idea of power. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish choice was always the power of ideas. And that makes us central, I think, to the human condition. You write in a letter in the scroll the following, Moses realized that a people achieves immortality not by building temples and mausoleums, but by engraving their values on the hearts of their children and they on theirs and so on until the end of time. Is that a is that ethics-based? Is that a spiritual blueprint? Is that different than a people who go through oppression and, uh, and savagery and massacre uh, and hold together, somehow hold together? What's specific about that prescription? Well, I think, you know, Jews came up with this sentence in the first book of the Bible that every human being, regardless of class, color, culture, or creed, is in the image and likeness of God. So Judaism created this idea of a society of equal dignity. Now, that's been a human search for a very long time. And most people, to echo Simon, have looked at it in terms of either wealth or power. You can be a communist and say we achieve equal dignity by equal wealth. Or you can be 
in favor of participative democracy, we have equal power. Jews knew that neither of those works. Some will always get more power than others, more wealth than others. And therefore, they came up with, I think, the most radical and workable idea of an equal society, equal access to knowledge. Mm. Because with knowledge, mm. the more you share, the more you have. Whereas with power or wealth, the more you share, the less you have. Mm. So I think we became the people whose citadels were schools, whose heroes mm. were teachers, and whose passion was study and the life of mm. the mind. Mm. Yeah, again, I, I think I'm going to spend the whole evening really just footnoting Jonathan, <laughs> which, was, which is a good thing to be able to do. <laughs> um, I, I couldn't agree more, but I, I, so my little footnote here is that the Jewish inquiry is an inquiry which, again, you know, the classical world does produce too, mm. especially the classical world as rediscovered by the Renaissance where it looks in a mirror and says, what is it to be human? What is it to be human? And, um, you know, in much of the, the, the classical world, actually outside Greece, I'm thinking of Mesopotamia and Egypt and, and so on, um, the image that is looked at is, is the image of the king god, the, the emperor with all his battalions. Jews were asked to consider the nature of humanity in terms of words, in terms of language. Um, we now know through, you know, extraordinary kind of linguistic scholarship into the early origins of the Bible that actually vernacular Hebrew it sort of precedes the writing of the Bible. Even if you push the Bible, which I rather do, I'm, I'm just a student of, of amazing scholars to about the 8th century, approximately the reign of Hezekiah as a continuous set of redactable scripts, that there are so-called ABCD, there are alphabetic exercises that have been discovered in a northern Negev, going back to the 11th and 12th century BC, which is extra extraordinary early variant on West Semitic Canaanite 22 letter. And if you think about that, it absolutely speaks to what Jonathan's just said. It is very hard to master um, hieroglyphic language or to master... Um, Cuneiform, if you're not in a very small educated elite, 22 letters written down in alphabet is for everyone. And a lot of those scholars, at least they persuaded me when I was researching volume one of the story of the Jews, that part of the genius of the many generations of Bible writers was to actually take the sacred texts and actually sieve it through this pre-existent earthy language. So for, uh, for in Judaism... Um, the, the, it's not just a matter of kind of the sacred penumbra of mystical illumination and subservience before the God King. If you all speak and if you're all encouraged to read out loud, there's that wonderful moment, isn't there, in kind of Ezra, when Ezra reads out loud the Torah and, you know, Korea ta Torah is is a vocal thing which presupposes this is around the a rebuilding of exactly. Jerusalem. Presuppose it's why Jews never shut up. You know, uh, <laughs> with the noise. No I have And that in at fact, all. it's a tradition, of course, as Jonathan knows, all the way through. Remember, Samuel Pepys goes into that first synagogue in um, the predecessor of Vevis Marx, and he, like so many people, is shocked by how noisy it is. People are constantly going into the great synagogue well, again. Here's and a footnote, Simon. When uh, <laughs> Prince Charles came to synagogue for a synagogue service for the first time in our shul in St. John's Wood, he sat in the warden's box during the evening service. It was the 50th anniversary of the State of Israel. And the first time a, a royal of that seniority has been to his service in a synagogue. And I asked him afterwards, did he enjoy it? And he said, you do talk a lot, don't you? <laughs> so I said, your Royal Highness, exactly so. People say the art of conversation is dead. I say it's alive and well and happens in the synagogue when you're supposed to be praying. <laughs> the, th the thing about that, it's in the Talmud, Jews that, that non-Jews, there'll be a lot here, I hope. Jews essentially communicate by agreed mutual interruption. You know, that's <laughs> a basic form of... 
because we have already discovered. All right, so I want, before I get into some contemporary matters, and I want to come back to the spiritual question that we started in, in uh, the green room. I'd like, Simon, let me start with you. Can you describe a physical journey that you have taken as part of your Jewish life and what you learned from it? Physical journey? Well, I was... I, hmm. Um, it, it, it's an old Jewish story. It's a story of um, uh, orthodoxy wandering away and kind of return, you know, to order to make myself sound like a kind of errant Old Testament figure. But that certainly would be true. I grew up... It, it, is that what you want to know, David? I mean, I grew up in an orthodox, um, but not Hasidic or um, certainly not Haredi. The word was unknown. Background, but we we kept kashrut, and I went to Ched. I was a Ched teacher, astoundingly, mm. for a little bit, um, and so you know went through all that, and then oh, many things happened. Adolescence happened, the nuclear disarmament movement happened, Marxism happened, Cambridge University happened. Happened to me in a different way from Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan had the fortitude to resist the 60s and its manifestation in, <laughs> in Cambridge University. But we were together at Thompson's Lane, I guess. Mm. Yes, we, so we were in the same shul in Cambridge, which I was there every Shabbat. So I, w but I became, I suppose, um, I became, insofar as I was still Jewish in that way, um, and this I know interests you very much, David, um, a Jew of comfortable social habit, I guess you would say, um, and and that, that, that I, I think, you know, you were egging me on earlier on to say, ah, but that's not enough. And it probably isn't enough, really. And then I, it was very, I, I, and, and stop me if this gets really very rambly, it probably already has. I did write a book of Jewish history um, called um, Two Rothschilds in the Land of Israel about Edmond de Rothschild, the French Rothschild, and the issue of, in fact, the, the beginnings, really, the... Or the the, the Chavavetzion, even pre-first Aliyah beginnings of the transplantation of Jews from Poland and Romania uh, into Eretz Yisrael in the 1870s and 1880s. And I, I, there's a long story about that, which you don't want to hear. But um, I was a kind of historian at that stage of my life in Cambridge in the late 60s and 70s, who felt that history was about writing the culture to which you did not belong, that part of history was really a, about a communion with people other than yourself in a different time in a different place. And there were also, when the book came out, it was, um, you know, no one needs to dash out and buy it, but I, I have nothing to apologize for it. But my Auntie Esther never spoke to me again. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I thought, I don't want to be dealing with this. So I ran away, basically, to different kind of, to France, to Holland, and, but I had a little seminar in Cambridge, actually, um, which was just kind of post-biblical with, with a friend of mine called Nicholas Delange, who you know, was Amos Oz's translator and a great scholar of late antiquity Judaism, of, uh, particularly of Philo. And, um, and we, just had, um, we just had a kind of reading group. That's really, or you didn't come, did you? Mm. You, didn't, you, didn't. you would have taught us. But it was, um, we had, it was just a wonderful thing. So it was my kind of philosophical secret, and it became more murky and more cowardly as I went on until, uh, you know, but it was, it, it, it was always there. I always read, I read Jonathan, I read Leo, and I read, it, 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 it was, it was a, a a voice talking to me. And then when the BBC said, the BBC producer phoned me up and said, after I finished, I can't remember what it was, a series on American politics, I think it was, yeah. He said, I've got the obvious idea for you, and you're either going to run a million miles away, or you're going to have to do it. And he didn't have to tell me what it was. Mm. And that's and that why I don't know the story that, of the Jews. No, it does. Yeah, it it yeah. does. Rabbi Sachs, actually, Simon answered two questions in one, even though I only asked him the one. But, um, <laughs> but that's what makes him brilliant. I'd like you, if you talk to us about your spiritual, religious background, how you grew up, but also for you, was there a, an actual trip, an actual journey of sorts mm. that you learned something that was profound sure. Jewishly? Sure. I went up to uh, Cambridge in 1966. Uh, by which time, Simon was already a legend. 
He was the Eloy, the prodigy of Cambridge. He'd just been appointed the youngest ever fellow of the Cambridge College, and, and it, it was wondrous in our eyes. On the other hand, we didn't see Simon all that often, I have to say, in the synagogue, <laughs> until, <laughs> until that moment that was a turning point, I think, in many lives, which is May, June, 67. Yeah, that's true. Those very, very anxious three weeks leading up to the Six-Day War, when Israel seemed outnumbered, outgunned, Nasser had spoken about driving Israel into the sea. We, who had been born after the Holocaust, thought, God forbid, there's going to be a second Holocaust. And at that moment, a kind of free song, a real sense of Jewish identity, touched an awful lot of people. Mm. And the fact that Simon used to come in every day to Thompson's Lane to Dublin Minicho with us yeah. told me, wow, if Simon's here, this is serious. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, that, you know, when that sudden denouement, this extraordinary victory, um, the question then really stayed with me. Until then, I'd thought Judaism is what a small bourgeois group in Finchley kind of do with their spare time, I suddenly realized that there's history here, there's peoplehood here. All of us felt connected to people whom we didn't know 3,000 miles away in a country that I'd only just visited for the first time. And so that question stayed with me for a year, and I decided the next year, the summer of 68, that I was going to make a journey to discover a little more about my Judaism, and I kind of came here to the States where I'd heard that there were a lot of great rabbis. I bought a Greyhound bus ticket for $100 and went all the way around meeting every rabbi I could think of. And uh, I met two rabbis who had a huge impact, who changed my life. One of them was the late Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, who had been, yeah, he was the leading Jewish thinker of the 20th century, but he'd written a, a doctorate on neo-Kantian metaph uh, metaphysics, epistemology. He knew, uh, he'd read everything. And from him I learned that you can face the entire intellectual world of Europe and not be afraid. That was number one. But the really transformative impact came with my meeting uh, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And that was an extraordinary moment that changed my life because, you know, the first thing I did was, I, 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 you know, I'm a total schlemiel, you know, I come along to America not knowing where anyone is, and I ask, where do you find the Lubavitcher Rebbe? So they said, go to 770 Eastern Parkway. I took the subway there. I walked in. I said, I've come 3,000 miles to meet the Lubavitcher Rebbe. They all cl collapsed laughing. They said, there are thousands of people who wait. Come back next year, you know. <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I didn't know what to say. You know, I had a chutzpah. That's, you know, that's number one survival mechanism. So I said, look, I don't know where I'm going to be. I'm wandering around the States, but I do know that I'll be with my aunt in Los Angeles. So if he finds and spare me a couple of minutes, please phone through to this number. One Sunday night, the call came through. The Lubavitcher Rebbe can see you on Thursday. And I had no money. I just had this Greyhound bus ticket. <laughs> It took three days nonstop on a Greyhound bus from Los Angeles uh, to 770 Eastern Parkway. And I sat for a half an hour with this great man. And I thought to myself, what does he need to waste time with a shlemiel like me from nowhere with nothing? But I found it very dramatic because after he'd answered all my questions, he started interrogating me. What are you doing for Jewish life in Cambridge? I began one of the, I was terribly English in those days. It's rubbed off since. <laughs> so I began this English sentence in the situation in which I find myself. <laughs> <laughs> and he cut through. I mean, he was not rude like us. I mean. He cut through in the middle of the sentence and said, nobody finds themselves in a situation. They put themselves in a situation. So if you put yourself in that situation, you can put yourself in another situation. And so he challenged me to go to Cambridge and lead. Um, there used to be, he used to have something called a Fabrengen, where thousands of Hasidim and he would speak for hours, and every 20 minutes they'd pause and they'd sing songs. And if you were about to leave, I was about to leave for the next day, and uh, during the songs, you came up with a bottle of vodka, 
and you poured a little in a thimble, and the Rebbe would say, L'chaim, and that would be the Rebbe's vodka that you took with you into the world. So I go up to the Rebbe in front of thousands and thousands of Hasidim, and instead of doing what he normally did, he would say, L'chaim. He turned to me and he said, you're going already? <laughs> I said, yes. He said, why? I said, because I have to get back to university. He said, the Cambridge term doesn't begin till the middle of October. <laughs> I think you should stay. Now, how he knew, I don't know. But he stayed. I stayed. I said, I can't stay because it's a charter flight and I can't. So the next morning, they kind of kidnapped me. They locked me in a room. I said, how am I going to get back? They said, we'll tell the airline you're ill. I said, what am, how am I ill? They said, tomorrow we'll take you to the rubber's doctor and he'll find what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got to spend Rosh Hashanah with the Lubavitcher Rebbe, heard him blow chauffeur. I mean, it was a transformative experience. Why? Because this, in Cambridge, I met very, very brilliant human beings. In the Lubavitcher Rebbe, for the first time, I met a holy human being. And that, to me, was very powerful. Why is it so hard for Jews <clears throat> to talk about God and spiritual life, Simon? Um, <laughs> about personal relationship with God? Well, you can, you can hear your own, you know, um, your own wonder about that, uh, amplified by my massive silence as you <laughs> put it like that. I, I, we're not a confessional, well, at least I, I, I've never felt Judaism to be confessional. I think <coughs> Jews argue about God, and they argue with God in, in the Bible, famously. And uh, there's sort of, but the sense actually, uh, well, at least I never had a very strong mystical sense. I mean, of course, there is Kabbalah, you know, and there, there, are, there is a certain kind of Hasidic mysticism, and all that's very important, but um, I don't know. I mean, I uh, belonged and grew up in a kind of more discursive, argumentative, you know, verbally interrogatory kind of Judaism, and a huge amount of Judaism um, you know, you read the Mishnah and the larger Talmud, really, is about life on earth, right. really. And understand, it my is... question is more about my own spiritual longing. It's certainly not a judgment. I mean, because no. for you and for so many others, there's great satisfaction in that. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a question for me because I do think that so much of our, it, you find it in the scripture, you find it in our liturgical life, there is a, a, a very personal conversation with God, but I think in modern Jewish life, in my life, growing up as I have, um, and in my community, I find that it's, it's more absent. Well, uh, let, let me try a slightly different tack. I think actually, you know, we've really broached this a bit, actually, and that's to say, um, first of all, God does not have a face in Judaism, as he does in Christianity. The notion of God as somebody, something that can be really embodied, as in the Christian tradition, is, is, I was going to say abhorrent, that's too extreme, but it's certainly alien to the Jewish tradition. Um, so the manifestation of God is in a set of teachings, and the teachings are overwhelmingly about how to comport oneself in, in this world, mm. I think. That's, that's part of it, I think, actually. Rabbi, um, I, I think Jews, Jews seek God's face. Yeah. We seek God's face in, in our tradition. We seek God's face. Psalm 27 says so. I think Jews were, until relatively recently, the God-intoxicated people. I don't think there are any more profound conversations with God than in the book of Psalms. I don't think there are any more passionate love songs about God than the Song of Songs. I mean, it's extraordinary that anyone put that book in a canon of sacred scriptures. And that this is, I mean, the eros is part of what it means to love God in Judaism. This is a passionate longing. And I have this feeling that something happened around 17th, 18th century. Somehow, exile had gone on too long. We say in our prayers, because of our sins, we were exiled from our land. We said, God says through Moses, you know, return to me and I will return to you. 
for 16 centuries, Jews were the most pious people. You know, they, they were not the people of the biblical age constantly tempted into idolatry. Yet wherever they went, they, they raised up scholars, they built yeshivot, they, 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 you know, they were fastidious in keeping the commands, and somehow redemption never came. There was a, a, a tidal wave of messianic longing around the time of Shabbatai Tzvi in the 17th century, and that was disappointed. And then, you know, this huge, uh, op- this, this, this gift by the Europe of enlightenment and emancipation, which is, you know, play down your Jewish identity and become one of us. And I think Jews made the terrible mistake, I have to say, of opting for that bargain rather than keeping their faith. Because number one, all that enlightenment and emancipation led really to the worst anti-Semitism we have ever known and to the worst human catastrophe we've ever known. And it also became something very problematic because anti-Semitism in the 19th and early 20th century became something not only out there, but something also in here. Because for centuries, millennia, Jews had seen their reflection in the eyes of God. And they had defined themselves as a people loved by God. When they lost faith and they first encountered anti-Semitism, they stopped defining themselves as the people loved by God and came to the conclusion that they were the people hated by the Gentiles. Mm. And out of that, there was no way out. And, and it was a terrible moment. So I happen to believe that you keep your faith whatever happens, because somehow or other, when you're drowning, you reach your hand up to heaven, and sometimes God grabs hold of that hand and lifts you. And that's my personal experience. Well, this is a very shocking thing to say about the Enlightenment, actually. Here we're going to disagree. Um, I think it's terrible to blame um, anti-Semitism on the naivety of someone like Moses Mendelssohn. I'm putting words into your mouth a bit, but let's say he's a classic example of a masquil. And what is so deeply moving about Jerusalem, Moses Mendelssohn's great work, is that he presupposes, and I know what happened to his family and generations on, it's true, but he presupposes with the greatest blessed optimism that Jews can live out in the world without sacrificing their Judaism. I, I, and, and we're here in America, Jonathan, which is the product of Enlightenment optimism. I'm not critical of the Enlightenment, Simon. Well, I'm happening. saying <laughs> the Enlightenment was a flight from particularity. And what we saw is the 18th century, the age of reason. In the 19th century, the return of the repressed, romanticism, nationalism, and so on. So I'm not at all critical of the Enlightenment. We would never... The Enlightenment was one of the great blessings of European culture, and I'm not negative about it one little bit. However, I have to tell you that in his letters and his diary, Moses Mendelssohn was one of the first already in the 1780s to pick up Jew hatred because he was roughed up in the street. In the park. And, yes, and, and, the and you know, he, he was one of the very first who had that intuition. The second thing is, in the closing two pages of Jerusalem in 1783, he defines Judaism as a burden. Bear your, this double burden as best you can. And, um, no, I mean, look, you know, Simon, I mean, what am I going to say? This is one of the ironies of history. No one No one ever wrote more beautiful music at the age of 16 than his Anical Felix uh, incidental music to A a Midsummer Night's Dream. I mean, you know, we gave some of the world's most beautiful music to the world. But let us see the Enlightenment as a great blessing, but let us be Jewish enough to know that every... Great blessing comes with the dark side as well. Sammy, can I pick up? But, but, you know, the the venom of anti-Semitism, since we've raised music, is is the Wagnerian moment, is Das Judentum in music. 1851. Absolutely. So it's the overthrow. It's what happens, Jews from Manasseh ben Israel, 
earlier, from Simone Luzzato, from Leone Modena, through to, you know, from the Venice ghetto, we're commemorating 500 years of that next year, through, you know, the age of the Masquille, um, was, was, was uh, an intense struggle to find how Jews can live in the world where they're not only Jews. Sure. It's great to live surrounded, if you're the Baba Chereba, by your followers and in, in a community of completely yeah. shared belief. But the, a majority of the people here, or maybe not a majority, you know, are, are living out in the world along with non-Jews. The, the comradeship between Moses Mendelssohn and Lessing yeah. was a great moment in the history of Jewish life. As I, think, well as I, the I think that Lessing's Nathan the Wise, which yeah. was his tribute to Mendelssohn, is one of the high points, one of the greatest contributions in, in the Enlightenment. It is in a, a, an extraordinary statement of, of religious tolerance, of way ahead of its time, still relevant today. And all I'm saying is this, Simon. I believe Jews must go out into the world. I've written books about this. I You've believe done it. it. Yourself. I've done it myself. I believe that to remain confined within the ghetto is a betrayal of what we're here for. In the first words of God to Abraham, he says, through you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. I think we've got to go out there. We've got to be engaged with the intellectual currents of our time, with, with the social issues of our time. I think we've got to be there. The only thing on which... I disagree with the assumptions of the Enlightenment. Is that the Enlightenment was universalism. We're all the same. Which meant the Jews had, in effect, to be secular Moranos. But Mendelssohn they, doesn't say that, does he? Well, no, no. He actually, what is special about Jerusalem is that he says, well, should we let him say something? I, mean, I guess yeah, we will. Really. Go on, Tim. He, no, he's no, the no, token of Americans. Oh, 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 my gosh. I'm so oh, flustered. Okay. I'm spilling. It's all right. That's all right. I just I wanted to steal the show. No, I, <laughs> let me do this. I apologize for that. I, I'll clean it up in just a few minutes. Um, <laughs> You've raised anti-Semitism, and I know a great many in the audience will want to hear about where we are in this crisis moment today. Um, how do you see the crisis of anti-Semitism today? Is it now? different from this period that you've studied, the, the, the post-Enlightenment period of the lie of assimilation in Europe and the anti-Semitism that occurred then? What are we seeing today? How would you describe it? Is it a crisis? Is it something less? Well, it's a horrible marriage between the kind of, you know... Um, the, the poisonous venom, which will not go away, of classic post-Enlightenment anti-Semitism, that instead of Jews being accused of the blood libel, although they do go on being accused of committing the blood libel, Damascus, 1840, the Bailey's trial in the early 20th century, uh, the vampirism of which Jews were supposed to be guilty was capitalist vampirism, wasn't it? That was, you know, Edouard Drummond, those terrible things. So if you read, the, the, if you can bring yourself to read the obscenely vile charter of Hamas, you're redeemed only by its comic lunacy when it says be on your guard against Jews because they dominate lions clubs and Rotarians, not any Rotary club I've ever been to. <laughs> um, you know. and so there are the kind of inadvertently idiotic things, but you know, then swallowing the protocols of the elders of Zion, hook, line, and sinker. Probably more people through the web now believe in the protocols of the elders of Zion than at any other time since the forgery was made. But I said it's a marriage between that and ferocious anti-Zionism. Ferocious anti-Zionism. So um, I, I do think the kind of a lot of the... You know, what Benjamin Netanyahu said, everybody should go to Israel, leave Europe, it's mm -hmm. the end of the road... That I could not disagree with more. Part of actually what Jews are, I, I don't know, what I, what I think Jews should be doing is actually bringing the long history of Jewish experience, the high points as well as the low points. For, for instance, give you one, one, one thing, um, example. Um, Zionism is grotesquely caricatured as an entirely alien colonial incursion into a Muslim Arab indigenous world, as though there was, from the Bible 
to the 20th century. No Jewish history with any roots, with any living presence in Eretz Yisrael. No one's heard of Safat. They don't know about Luriadic Kabbalah, you know, any, any of that long history. You tell people there was a Jewish majority in Jerusalem at the turn of the 20th century, they think you're kidding or lying or both. So there is, there is it, 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 you know, one of the things that sort of has to be done in addressing non-Jewish audience is, and this, this is an Enlightenment ideal, is essentially ed educational. Mm -hmm. And I would say that um, you know, there are so many difficult aspects because actually part of the murderous virulence which starts with anti-Zionism and then morphs into the kind of idiocy seen in the Hamas Charter is a result of the blowback of the death of empire. So we have large Muslim populations of disaffected and often disadvantaged young people all over Europe who buy into right. the crude equation. And Rabbi between... Sachs, you wrote in the Wall Street Journal a couple of years ago, the notion that Israel's foreign policy or national security policy is hatched in a kosher supermarket in Paris is lunacy. Mm. That's anti-Semitism. Yeah. How are these two forces, though, linked in a way that makes this a unique threat? Well, look, first of all, let's just, you know, let's, the first thing is the Jewish way of never being too intimidated is to make a joke out of it. So my favorite story is these two Jews in Vienna in a coffee house in 1933. One is reading the local Jewish newspaper. The other is reading the notoriously anti-Semitic rag called Der Sturmer. And the first one says, how can you read that? That's full of anti-Semitic vile poison. And the second one with a big smile says, when you read your newspaper, what does it say? The Jews are arguing, they're divided, they're assimilating, they're disappearing. When I read mine, what do I discover? Jews control the banks, they control the media, they control the world. <laughs> he says, no, if you want the good news about the Jewish people, always read the anti semites <laughs> The real question is this, and it's an interesting question. Anti-Semitism is a virus. Europe, after the Holocaust, created, it's, it's the most sophisticated and complete attempt ever to strengthen the European immune system so that it could never be exposed to the virus of anti-Semitism again. 50 years of anti-racist legislation, 50 years of interfaith dialogue, 50 years of, of uh, Holocaust education. And somehow or other, what a virus does to defeat any immune system is to mutate. So in the Middle Ages, Jews were hated for their religion. In the 19th and early 20th century, they were hated for their race. Today, they are hated for their nation state. That is a major mutation. The other thing that happened is you can cure an epidemic within a given population, but you are seriously in trouble if it spreads to another population. So while Europe was curing itself of the virus of anti-Semitism, Meanwhile, the Arab and Muslim world was getting infected by an anti-Semitism that was strictly European. And Simon alluded to both elements of it. Number one, the blood libel. I think as Brits, we have to admit the blood libel was created in Britain. In England, yes. In Norwich in 1144. Lincoln. And in 1983, the Syrian defense minister, Mustafa Tlas, wrote a book called The Matzah of Zion, right. explaining why Israelis kill Palestinian children to use their blood to make matzah. In 1991, the Syrian representative at the United Nations Commission of Human Rights advised, asked every member of the UN Commission on Human Rights to read the book so they would understand what was uh, the nature of Zionist racism. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, exposed as a forgery by the London Times in 1921, was taken into the Arab world by the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who spent the war in Berlin, you know, working for the SS. And uh, it has been, you know, a major, it is a major text, and as Simon said, incorporated in the Hamas Charter. Egyptian television did a 40-part yep. adaptation in 2002. Syrian television did a 40-part adaptation. 
uh, during uh, Ramadan in 2003. So the blood libel and the protocols have infected a world that didn't know these particular Do libels. You, are you offended by the notion of, of uh, what Netanyahu said, that, that Jews should leave Europe? I'll tell you the irony, and, and it's a very important one, that there is one huge difference between anti-Semitism now and anti-Semitism in the 1930s. Today, we have, thank God, a state of Israel. We have a home in the Robert Frost sense of the place where when you have to go there, they have to let you in. And therefore, mm. it is not only Jews in Israel, but it is Jews in Europe who can say, I am not homeless, therefore I refuse to be intimidated. I am going to stand and fight. And Israel has changed Jewish life for those inside and for those outside. Yeah. Simon, there's a moment. Yeah, I couldn't. Uh, yeah. It, has beautifully occurred. It, it has had that mutually nourishing effect. Right. I'm just concerned, really, that, that it's, you know, that it's not seen as a zero-sum game. And we're, we're two very English, even though I've lived half my life in the United States, you're hearing two very English voices here. Um, I, because, because people constantly ask me, I don't know if they ask you, Jonathan, you know, is it all over in Britain as well as France and so on? And you want to make a distinction. The most venomous um, anti-Zionism, anti-Israeli hostility, which, which exactly, as you beautifully put it, sort of mutates into um, a more traditionally odious anti-Semitism in Britain, in my view, is in the chattering classes, as we call them in Britain, is actually in the world, this doesn't make it less distressing, I have to say, in the world of intellectual comment. Just two days ago, a hundred cultural personalities, if that's not an oxymoron, in this case, I think it is, <laughs> signed on to a cultural boycott of Israel, including some of my friends who bloody well should know better, or ex-friends who should know better. Um, the population at large in Britain, unless, I mean, you, you're there more than I am and in every way, does not strike me as um, Munich, 1931, 1932, or a, a, at all. Although, <laughs> probably Record that's what German Jews were saying in Munich in 1931. Recorded but levels of anti-Semitism in Britain, and I'm referring to the latest surveys, are actually lower. lower than they are in the United States. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a general population that is not anti-Semitic in the slightest. But there is an additional factor which I think is incredibly important. And I already said this 12 years ago in the EU headquarters in Brussels when we had the first European conference on anti-Semitism with Romano Prodi. We've done so since with Jose Manuel Barroso and Angela Merkel. And I, I said, and I repeat this always, Jews cannot fight anti-Semitism alone. The victim cannot cure the crime. The hated cannot cure the hate. I will lead the fight, and I really have done this, for the right of Christians throughout the world to lead their faith, live their faith without fear. But I need you Christians to fight for that Jewish right. Mm -hmm. In Britain, we led the fight against Islamophobia, but I say to Muslims, you must help us lead the fight against Judeophobia. Let me ask, and I, I think we're close to, to taking your questions as well, and before I turn to those, Simon, there was this, uh, and just like that. <laughs> <laughs> Let there be questions. Thank you. Simon, there's one of the really poignant moments of, um, of your series was you standing at the security barrier and kind of reckoning with what modern-day Israel represents um, to Jews, to Israelis, to the concept of um, Jews being a light uh, unto other nations. And when you spoke to an, uh, a settler and your, your discomfort was, was evident in that interview, you wrote in, that, that the Bible is many things, but a blueprint for peace in the Holy Land, it is surely not. What do you make of Israel today? What, what gives you hope? What, what troubles you? Oh, the hope. In, well, if we're talking about the internal um, 
character of Israel, the hope of, I'm always, you know, um, I'm always deeply moved and thrilled and astonished, actually. That last chapter in Ari Shavit's wonderful book, I think, actually, mm, not yes. perfect, but none of us write perfect books except Jonathan. <laughs> um, um, so I think it was very, you know, profound about that. So I think um, first you have to, as Jonathan very movingly put it, it, it we have a home now. That is, the, that is the big difference. It doesn't presuppose divided allegiance or make our home in the United States or Britain or France or wherever uh, compromised at all. But that is, that is uh, extremely important. Um, the one figure I, you know, <laughs> I don't know why, I, I missed this out from when you asked me about my journey, was that when, I mean, three or four years before um, Jonathan was um, sitting with... Um, with the Lubavitcher Rabbah, with Menachem Mendel Schneerson, I was meeting Ben Gurion, actually, not one to one, I have to say, at all. And he was an extraordinary figure then. He'd retired, he was living in Stabokhe, he came to talk uh, to a bunch of kids in Jerusalem. And then there was also the message that the only place for young Jews or Jews of any kind was to go on Aliyah and to come to Israel. But that was the kind of official speech. He was really wanted to know what Jewish life was actually like if you weren't going to do this, if you were going to put Aliyah on hold. And I was in Habonim, I was, uh, you know, uh, baby Zionist. I was working on a Habonim kibbutz. I had that kind of sense. But the sense I had of Israel then and I've always had is of a kind of combination of a, a, a sort of commonwealth built on a sense of tzedakah, of, on, on justice um, rather than pure power. I, mean, I don't go all the way with Martin Buber. You know, those were times of of impossible idealism, but I'm a two-state Zionist, I always have, have been, and, you know, uh, Israel is not a monolithic place. Half of Israel's polity, we'll see what happens in the election, half of um, Israeli, is, Israelis also believe that there has to be some way in which the Palestinian population and the Israeli population live side by side. And the settler was someone for whom biblical prophecy about territory, um, messianic redemption defined in kilometers of real estate was the most important thing. And that I, I, I think and still thought and still think is kind of profoundly misguided. But Israel is, apart from other great miracles, a, you know, a true democracy in a region where democracy is not only absent, but shrinking with every day that passes. And Jonathan, when you look at surveys around the world that show that Israel is increasingly isolated, um, do you worry about its path? Do you worry about um, the role that Israel can play as a tie that binds Jews around the world? <laughs> Look, I, I happen to think that Israel is an extraordinary human miracle. Israel has taken the Hebrew language, the language of the Bible, and made it speak again. It's taken a land that lay desolate for so many centuries and make it bloom again, but it has taken this scattered, shattered people and make it live again. And I think Israel is the most extraordinary thing. As it, and in terms of democracy, I call Israel a, a hyper-democracy. You know, every taxi driver is a political pundit who could, <laughs> does better than the op-eds, you know. And so I think Israel is an extraordinary place of creativity, diversity. There's more diversity yeah. in this tiny country than you'll find in whole continents elsewhere. And I, I, I think it's incredibly, incredibly powerful. At the same time, it's also, I say, you know, I say the Greeks gave the humanity the concept, and it's a very powerful concept of tragedy. And I say that because there was never an Aeschylus or a Sophocles among the Jewish people. Instead, we had an Isaiah and a Jeremiah. Jeremiah, yeah. And, and, and I said, Judaism is the principal defeat of tragedy in the name of hope. 
And what I see in the Middle East is one of those things I never ex expected. It is an unfolding Greek tragedy in a nation and a culture that always lived by the principle of hope. So I've always said that no Jew, knowing what we know of history, can be an optimist. But no Jew worthy of the name ever gave up hope. And it is no accident that Israel is the country that called its national anthem, Hatikva. That is the song Israel sings for the world. And so I think a day will come as we see uh, Syria, Iraq, now Libya, Yemen, and other places collapsing into chaos, into barbarisms and crimes against humanity of a kind we haven't seen since the Middle Ages. And there is Israel doing its little thing of showing that in a, area, a region of the world that never really knew democracy, you can be a successful democracy. In a country that has no natural assets except its people, you can move from a third world to a cutting edge first world economy. At some stage, there must come a time when uh, peace will come, if only. Well, they said about one of my predecessors, the late Chief Rabbi J.H. Hertz, who was a fairly argumentative guy. I would never come into that category at all, Simon. No. Uh, <laughs> the Dictionary of National Biography says about Chief Rabbi Hertz that he never despaired of a peaceful solution to a problem once every other alternative had been exhausted. <laughs> So I think one day peace will come, if only from exhaustion. Let me get to some of our, our, uh, our questions here, and, and we'll try to get through as many of these as we can, so maybe we'll try to be a little bit uh, briefer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now you are trying to provoke <laughs> us. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just thought I'd be ridiculous. Um, what is your view of Israel's treatment of the Palestinians? Um, it's a very unhappy situation. I mean, incredibly unhappy situation. Um, uh, you know, you can't but look, actually, at what Palestinians um, have to go through in order, you know, for example, to get to, you know, from one bit of the West Bank into Israel to work and, and not feel desolate about it. Um, but it's... Um, as I said, it's, 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 it's essential, first of all, it's essential to make a distinction between mm -hmm. Hamas-ruled Gaza and the West Bank. Um, and as we know from the negotiations between Olmert and Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen in 2008, um, it's possible to actually come to some sort of understanding with the Palestinian Authority, but it's incredibly difficult to do so with Hamas. But um, it, it, the argument, part of the argument that's going to happen in the, in the next election will be, do we have a partner to work with or not? Um, the, treatment of, the treatment of Palestinians will, will not get better until there is kind of active political engagement on that front. I think, I, I, the, look, the alternative, the alternative to accepting that there will be a Palestinian state at some point is annexation, in which case Israel has a terrifying demographic problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult, you, you, you know, it, it's not kind of doves who came to this conclusion, it's, it's Ariel Sharon who came to this conclusion, that if Israel needs to, if Israel can, you know, has, if Israel will remain a Jewish democracy, it can't be a Jewish democracy that annexes the West Bank. Rabbi, what, again, from our audience, what role do you think the concept of teshuvah and forgiveness have on Jewish survival? I think uh, teshuvah and forgiveness are two of the most important concepts that Jews brought into the world. If you, you know, one of the problems in philosophy for two and a half thousand years, human free will. Are we free? Do we have a choice? You remember what Isaac Beshevis Singer said? We have to be free. We have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> and if I want an empirical proof of free will, I'll say it's tshuva. You know, we can change. And that is one of the most important uh, 
contributions Jews made to the world. Carol Dweck at Stanford, mindset. You know, this idea of the growth mindset. The Judah, the Yehuda, the brother of Joseph, that we meet in Genesis 37, the one who proposes selling Joseph into slavery, is the Judah who, a few chapters later, is the one who's prepared to stay as a slave rather than see his brother Benjamin made a slave. So when you look at the Bible, this idea that, you know, it was when I read Emma for the first time that I suddenly read a novel where the, the chief character is different at the end of the novel than she was at the beginning. And I think that's this very Jewish uh, outset uh, insight. The other thing is forgiveness. Emunah, Pardon? Yeah. Emunah, really. Well, Emma and Emunah. Oh, yeah, I never <laughs> thought of that. You're quite right. And uh, forgiveness, you know. I, I, the first recorded act of forgiveness in all of world literature is when Joseph forgives his brothers. Mm -hmm. As uh, the philosopher, non-Jewish, I think, called David Constant, wrote a book in 2010 called Before Forgiveness. And he analyzes the fact that the Greeks didn't have a concept of forgiveness. They had a concept of appeasement, which is different for forgiveness. And again, you know, the trouble is we didn't emphasize this enough. We let Christianity say Judaism is not a religion of forgiveness and it's not a religion of love. Whereas when Jesus talks about love, he's quoting Torah. He's qu quoting, love your neighbor as yourself, from Leviticus 19. And then he's quoting from Shema, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Now, Plagi I... Plagiarizing hello. Plagiar <laughs> well, plagiarizing, yeah. So, you know, when I read uh, Hannah Arendt in The Human Condition saying Christian, Christianity invented forgiveness, I find it quite hard to forgive her, but I... Well, <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you how we have lost touch with our own deepest ideas. There's a rabbi I know, uh, an Orthodox rabbi who works, teaches at a Mennonite university and works in peace and reconciliation. And he goes around the country to places where there are very few Jews, and he talks about peace and reconciliation. And he told me that he went to one town where there weren't that many Orthodox Jews, but an elderly Orthodox couple, hearing an Orthodox rabbi is coming to give a talk in the local university, sit in the front row, elderly, and he gives a lecture about love and forgiveness. And he tells me that the man turned to his wife and says, he talks like a Gentile. <laughs> you know, why did we give away our best ideas and the finest idea we ever had was that God created the world in love and forgiveness, asking us to love and forgive one another. Mm. Another question here, does progressive Judaism have a future? And if so, where does it find its, so its soul? And how best can it communicate that honest search? That's for you. <laughs> you know, I, 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 Rabbi, one of the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to impute something into this that it kind of, you know, I think part of this question about progressive Judaism is, to me, where the role of, Zionism and Israel is in Jewish life among progressive Jews. Yeah. Is their Jewishness defined by their Zionism? And if, if their Jewish identity and their love for Israel is perhaps a little bit more removed from the core, then what makes up but what, identity? What gives you that idea? When were you last in a reform synagogue? I belong in a reform. Oh, a reform last synagogue. Shabbat then. But why, why do you have that idea? Um, because I believe David, that because particularly Simon, younger Jews who do not wake up in America fearful of the end of Israel or of anti-Semitism do not feel the same uh, collective sense of identity revolving around Israel. And I think there is a longing. I think that there is a quest to, to know God, to be inspired, to have spiritual life, to have a sense of meaning and purpose. And I don't believe that collective identity around uh, even arguing over sacred texts, which many of you unaffiliated Jews do, or even a, a, a deep interest in Israel's present or future is what, is what motivates them and brings them together in community. That's my I, experience. I was with, uh, I spoke... Uh, just four days ago at the National Convention of BBYO, the B'nai B'rith Youth Organization, which is, I think, majority reformed Jews um, in Atlanta. And I have to tell you, these kids know mm. the joy of Judaism. Mm. 
their, their soul sings. They, 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 they were noisy. Yeah, I mean, uh, but... I, I think, you know, I knew a guy called Avram Infeld who used to, for some years, ran Hillel in America, and I remember him coming to me and saying, you know, I've just been to a Hillel convention that had an Orthodox service, conservative service, uh, reform minion, and a Reconstructionist minion, and all four minionim were Kalbach. <laughs> and I think that's one very powerful discovery. You know, we were terribly cognitive. But at the end of the day, when Jews talk... They argue. But when they sing, they sing together. Az Yashir Moshe at the Red Sea, they sang a song together. So if you want to end the arguments, move from words to music, because words are the language of the Jewish mind, but music is the language of the Jewish soul. And I think that's what reform have rediscovered, and it's going to reconnect us all. Do you think that's a real issue, what Simon and I were just going back and forth? I'll tell you, I think the problem reform have with Israel is because uh, of the way they've framed Israel. You know, we, we identify with Israel by being pro-Israel at a political level. I think that is completely the wrong way to look at it. it re I cannot begin to tell you how wrong it is. Do you think it's just a reform, a, a denominational issue, or do you think it's par in part generational, or do you think it's mostly that, mostly a reform, an unaffiliated Jewish issue? Uh, well, I'm not sure I accept the premise that, you, that you, you're saying really essentially reform identity is built so disproportionately around a kind of unexamined support for Israel, a kind of purely, is that what you're saying? No, no, that's oh, not what I'm saying. Oh, okay, well, no, I no, misunderstood no, no, yeah. you then. I misunderstood you then. I'm just so, saying, I mean, I, I'm saying whether it's in, in my community, whether I think Rabbi said, there's more criticism of Israel politically, but I also mean generationally, I'm 44, and generationally, I don't think that there is as much adherence to Israel and all it represents as the core of Jewish identity, as opposed to a kind of spiritual longing, which I think is accessible and is in our tradition. It's in our scripture, it's in our liturgy, it's, it's in our songs. It's so rich. David, I'd, I'd well, like to tell you that what I think is the way of framing this for the future of American young people. Jews have been almost everywhere in the world, one way or another. But if you read the Torah, what you find, this is not a manual for the soul, individual souls ascent to heaven. It's an instruction manual for the construction of a society built around justice, compassion, human dignity, freedom. In everywhere that Jews have been in the world in 40 centuries, there was only ever one spot on earth where Jews were able to construct a society in light with their deepest beliefs, and that's Israel. The Tikkun Olam projects that happen in Israel, whether, you know, at an educational level, medicinal level, you know, the guys out there in the Galil using medicine to reach out to Bedouin, Christian, and Muslim populations. There are people out there using music to bring people together. And that is how they should relate to Israel. If you want to change the world, this is the one place where you can build a society along Jewish lines. So forget the political debates mm -hmm. that you will run into on campus and focus on the humanitarianism of this incredible country that's taking handicapped kids, the late Reuven Feuerstein, who was the world's greatest in dealing with severely handicapped and, and brain-damaged children, or the incredible medicinal things, or the, the economic, you know, raising up difficult families, to, to, all these things, Israel is absolutely outstanding. That's not the Israel we see. That's not the Israel they relate to. Mm -hmm. And that's the Israel every one of them could relate to. Mm -hmm. Well, I, there's so many things I want, I want to say, unfortunately. First of all, I want to come back to you, your point, because I, I just want to clear this up. And there'll be a lot of people in conservative congregations here, reform congregations, I'm sure, who know actually that one of the joys, because I... In particularly West London Synagogue, where I'm a member, I belong to two shuls on two different sides of the, the Atlantic. But the pleasure in detailed discussion of the Torah, of the Mishnah, of the Talmud is, is every bit as intense and preoccupied and elated in an intellectually complicated way in these communities as I imagine it is in 
in, in ultra-Orthodox communities. Secondly, I would say that division of opinion about Israeli policies is certainly, I don't know, I, I, I don't know how one would actually measure it in, in the United States, but it seems to be something actually which does not divide along denominational lines. You can go to Israel, as you know, and you'll find plenty of critics, actually, of Yisrael Betenu and the right-wing parties among the Orthodox. You know? I, Simon, I and, disagree, but, but what I think it's important but, to point out, whether it's in conservative or reform, it's not. There are vast members of these congregations who do not know our history, who do not know the liturgy. Of course there are those who are, and I'm sure you're in, in, in uh, groups that do, as I am in groups that do, but there are a lot of Jews, in, in, and they are more in reform and maybe even conservative synagogues, who do not know of these debates, who do not know of our tradition. I do believe, I mean, that's... that's the best well, thing American Jewry has done in recent years is the birthright program. Yeah which instead of talking about Israel, Good. took kids yeah. to right. Israel. But I just wanted to take on that I, point, but I don't disagree with you that there is that robust dialogue in, across all communities. But well, I, I, I want to say one more thing, actually. If, can I? Of course. <laughs> I guess that's the most disingenuous question I've put all night. <laughs> <laughs> I already knocked over the water. I don't have any other dramatic... To Jonathan's left. point, it, I also want to say there is work. Look... We're living in a world in which there are three horrible, horrible problems. One is the slow death of the planet, not so great. Secondly is the colossal distance between rich and poor worldwide. The third is something which you and I think, I don't think, you know, speaking of the Enlightenment, we thought would happen. The hideous return of tribal barbarism and the most brutal forms of religious intolerance. If there's one thing that Jews can do outside Israel, here in the world, actually, and this is, you know, waving the flag of Manasseh ben Israel and Moses Mendelssohn, is to talk, as you've been doing this, as your whole life's been about this, is actually the possibility of coexistence without the adulteration of your core beliefs. Yeah. You're the, you're the my, most my, distinguished yeah. example yeah. of saying those very things, and that is work to be done in the Golan. Yeah. I, I, let me just add a little footnote, David, because you've been incredibly patient. <laughs> and and I, I say it takes us Brits a while to realize right. that American you English... Notice how they use the term footnote. Like they're gonna, <laughs> no, just, it's just a little something. <laughs> Please. It takes us a while to realize that not every word means the same in American English as English <laughs> English. And one of the key examples is the word momentarily, oh, which yeah. in English yeah. English means briefly, yeah. but in American English means soon. Yeah. And so people introduce me by saying, um, Rabbi Sachs will speak momentarily. Yeah, I know. And the I reply... Friends, rabbis never speak about <laughs> the, the, worst, the worst time would happen. I remember American Airlines um, flight attendants say, it's all right, folks, we'll be in the air momentarily. And I thought, well, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> what was the last point? What was the <laughs> I, uh, no, Remind me, what was the question? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I know, we were talking about reform and conservative Jews. I don't know. It was <laughs> spiritual longing. I oh, know, but you were talking about... Uh, Oh, it's something he was praising you about the work you've done about about the return to my, tribal hatred and anti my next book yes out in the states in September is a protest against violence in the name of God mm -hmm. and it will be called not in God's name yeah. that from heaven God is saying not in my name it'll be the strongest book I ever wrote and I'm reaching out to Christians to Muslims and let me tell you, David, I have spent days with an ex-Hamasnik from, from uh, the West Bank who has become a peace activist. So I don't Where? give up... What? Where? In Israel. In Israel. Yeah, in Israel. Fantastic. So I don't give up on anything, but I think what we're seeing with ISIS, what we're seeing in, in, with Boko Haram and so on, is simply unacceptable. And we have to stand up as religious leaders and say, not in God's name. Amen. I want to... Um, I, I, there's a final area that I'd like you both to weigh in on, and the, the, the question here um, 
invited something that I wanted to ask anyway, but I want to read the question because I thought it was well, well struck here. Where is the future of Jewish life? Zionists say Israel, Hasidim say Williamsburg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Lithuanians say yeshiva, modern Orthodox say university. Where is the future? But I'm going to combine that with something that I was thinking about, that, Rabbi, you've written about in, in a number of books, including um, Future Tense, which is if we, if we celebrate Jewish survival, we must ask then to do what? So what is Jewish purpose in 2015? And I mean not just in the collective, in, out of our sense of as a people, but I do return to something I care about, which is as individuals as well. What is our individual purpose? What is the point, the meaning of this survival that we as individuals take out as Jews into the world as those individuals, but also as part of something larger? I once asked <clears throat> Paul Johnson, a Catholic historian, who wrote a very fine history of the Jews, and uh, I said to him, Paul, you know, you're a Catholic. You must have spent years researching Jews and Judaism. What most impressed you? And he gave a very interesting answer. He said there have been, through history, some very famous individualistic cultures, Athens, Renaissance Italy, contemporary West. There have been some very collectivist cultures, you know, Soviet Union, Chinese communism. He said, nobody managed to do both at the same time. Jews have had that gift, an incredible sense of the importance of the individual, but at the same time, an equally powerful sense of collective responsibility. And I thought it was extraordinary that this Catholic had come in effect to the same conclusion as Hillel, who said, if I am not for myself, who will be? But if I am only for myself, who am I? What am I? And I actually think that that is what the world needs right now. The West, having lapsed into various idolatries, most obviously the nation state or the race, is now worshipping the individual, you know, because you're worth it. I want it all, I want it now. The icon of our age is the selfie. So we're worshipping the self. So, you know, we can relate to that because Jews value the self. On the other hand, you've got these very collectivist cultures in the Middle East where, you know, everyone's... Jews are the only people who've managed to combine the best of both. Every Jew is an individual. We say in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, but no Jew was ever a sheep. So we're a nation of individualists, but at the same time we say, Kol Yisrael, our raven zebazer, we are all linked to one another. As Shimon Bayochai put it in the late first century, when one Jew anywhere is injured, all Jews feel the pain. So I think that is a unique message. No other religion has combined particularity and universality, the self and the greater good. And I think the world needs that message. Mm. And I think now is the time to engage with the world. Now is not the time to be fearful and stand alone. Let us reach out our hand in friendship to our brothers and sisters in the Abrahamic monotheisms, in Christianity and Islam. Let us reach out beyond faith altogether and say that we're not the only truth, but we're a voice. I call Judaism the voice of hope in the conversation of humankind. Mm. To you, Simon, the, the sense of the lesson of this evening and this conversation, what is Jewish purpose as you see it in 2015? Well, I, you know, we're coming back, I think, to where we began, which is... As, as Jonathan says, the preoccupation is, it, it is obsessively with the maximization of individuals, you know, uh, individual wealth, individual power, 
uh, and also, I think, actually, um, partly because of the digital world we're all in, um, the short shelf life of memory. Mm. Not too long from now, we're going to be sitting down at the Seder table. We're the only religion in our particular way in which we're required by the Torah, Zachor, to remember. And what we remember, we don't remember victory and triumph in imperial slaughter. We remember servitude and suffering and freedom and a redemption which included the blessing of a code of ethics, how to be a human being. And the purpose also is to uproot terrible prejudices. So Yitzhak and Moshe were passing a church one day, and a sign was up which said, converts needed, 50 pound bonus for signing. <laughs> so Moshe says, we can't do this, so Shanda, 50 pounds, time is hard. And how, how bad can it be? Um, Murano's constantly doing this, coming back to Shufa, there's no problem. So he comes out and Itzik said, so how was it? And um, Itzik said, well, it's all right. And Moshe says, well, you know, can I have my share of the, of the 50 pounds? And Itzik said, that's all you Jews think about, money, money, money. <laughs> you have to uproot prejudice as well. <laughs> Over to you, Gregory. Um, and my, my theory of how to fill an empty synagogue, put an enormous sign out front saying, no Jews admitted. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get him in. Um, I, I just have to uh, conclude by saying uh, what an honor it's been to, to be on this stage with both of you. I, <laughs> I, uh, you were terrific. I, uh, I just... I'm, I'm privileged to learn uh, from both of you uh, before now and tonight. So thank you both. Thank you all for your time tonight. Thank you.